Welcome and good evening, fellow kindred. Tis I, Toreador Troubadour. Though I have on occasion been mistaken for both a Tremere and even a Bruja, if you can believe such things. I am your overall friendly and fashionable and ever so clever thin blood scholar. I know it's quite a mouthful, but don't you worry. You just sit back in your lovely pleated armchair, and I'll do the rest of the talking. Today, in our Book of Nod series, we begin attending the actual scripture, cantos and mythos recorded within the Book of Nod. The book is divided into three primary testaments. In order, they are as such, the Chronicle of Cain, the Chronicle of Shadows, and the Chronicle of Secrets. In this video, we will cover the Chronicle of Cain allowing us to give each testament its own slot while properly delving into each of the following testaments with proper pacing and detail. In order to achieve clarity on the subjects while maintaining the supposed author's intent, I shall be orating the scriptures and then providing a brief synopsis on the purpose and meaning behind said scripture, behind said scripture before moving onward. The Chronicle of Cain itself is separated into seven different scriptures in a seemingly chronological context meaning that as we progress through the scriptures, we are in fact treading a historical timeline, though we only have the equivalent of vague sentiments to go off of. The seven scriptures are the first of times, the coming of Lilith, Lilith's magic, the temptation of Cain, Zilla's tale, the tale of the crone, and the tale of the first city. And note that my copy of the Book of Nod is a quick transcription of the original print and wrought with a number of spelling errors. I'll be sure not to verbally make these mistakes, but understand they were not my mistake to have been made in the first place. It took me a great deal to get my hands on a copy, and I won't complain about the condition as long as it's legible. Also, let it be clear that Delora and Beckett have included various addendums and notes included and scattered throughout each scripture, marked by various digits in ascending order as they appear. After I orate each script, I will briefly go over each addendum so as to not break the fluidity of each scripture. Feel free to pause whenever you feel necessary. Also, let it be known that the notes that Delora and Beckett take up within this oration are quite lengthy, and therefore I will be providing uh, timestamps in the description below if you wish to avoid them. I found them tedious, but necessary to include nonetheless. Now, let us begin with the first times. I dream of the first times, the longest memory. I speak of the first times, the oldest father. I sing of the first times and the dawn of darkness. In Nod, where the light of paradise lit up the night sky and the tears of our parents wet the ground, each of us, in our way, set about to live and take our sustenance from the land. And I, firstborn Cain, I with sharp things planted the dark seeds, wet them in earth tended them, watched them grow. And Abel, second-born Abel, tended the animals, aided their bloody births, fed them, watched them grow. I loved him, my brother. He was the brightest, the sweetest, the strongest. He was the first part of all of my joy. Then one day, our father said to us, Cain, Abel, to him above, you must make a sacrifice, a gift of the first part of all that you have. And I, firstborn Cain, I gathered the tender shoots, the brightest fruits, the sweetest grass. And Abel, secondborn, Abel slaughtered the youngest, the strongest, the sweetest of his animals. On the altar of our father, we laid our sacrifices and lit fire under them and watched the smoke carry them up to the one above. The sacrifice of Abel, secondborn, smelled sweet to the one above, and Abel was blessed. And I, firstborn Cain, I was struck from beyond by a harsh word and a curse, for my sacrifice was unworthy. I looked at Abel's sacrifice, still smoking the flesh, the blood. I cried. I held my eyes. I prayed in night and day. And when Father said the time for sacrifice has come again, and Abel led his youngest, his sweetest, his most beloved to the sacrificial fire, I did not bring my youngest, my sweetest, for I knew the one above would not want them. And my brother, beloved Abel, said to me, Cain, you did not bring a sacrifice, a gift of the first part of your joy, to burn on the altar of the one above. I cried tears of love as I, with sharp things, sacrificed that which was the first part of my joy, my brother. 
and the blood of Abel covered the altar and smelled sweet as it burned. But my father said, Cursed are you, Cain, who killed your brother. As I was cast out, so shall you be. And he exiled me to wander in darkness, the land of Nod. I flew into the darkness. I saw no source of light, and I was afraid and alone. This series of texts serves to depict an image of the first times of man, supposedly as Cain had seen it, and also serves to show how Cain arrived at his banishment and his supposed crimes he had committed. It's widely debated whether or not Cain could have known murder, for he was the first son, and death of man had not occurred before him. This act marks him as the first murderer. De Laurent and Beckett detail each scripture with notes that provide further detail or extrapolation where they can. I will begin as such. Uh, Note 1. The first times discussed in this stanza have been researched thoroughly by myself and my fellow kindred. The original texts speak of a time before. The oldest piece of the Book of Nod has been dated just before the time of Sumer, around 4500 BC. Uh, Addendum 2. I assume in this that the first stanza is the original narrator, perhaps the first translator of Cain's story. 3. Nod, in this case, meaning the Unknown Lands, supposedly the lands outside of Eden, which were not named at that time. 4. Latin translation reads, with a plowshare. The translation is from the original Sumerian, and just implies a sharp thing. This could be a prehistoric spike tool used for planting seeds. It is definitely tooth-like, possibly formed of some mammals' canines, or at least it is depicted thus in the Kunin debris fragment and the St. Clair tapestry. Uh, Addendum 5. That Cain was originally a farmer would fall in line with his existence in the myth as a sun king slash dying god figure, much like the character of Demuzi slash Tammuz in the Inanna slash Ishtar myth. Addendum 6. Blood in birth in this case, of course, perhaps being a result of the recent fall. Note that this is the first instance of the word blood in the narrative. The translation sense of the word is more along the lines of what we would consider blood rather than the vitae cognate, which implies some extra virtue or potency. Addendum 7. The first part is a phrase repeated throughout the Book of Nod. It means, essentially, the best, the cream, as in the cream of the crop. Note 8. Father, in this specific case, generally is thought to be Adam. Note 9. I'm translating this as exactly as possible. Because of the nature of the myth, one can easily assume that this is the god of the Hebrews and later Christianity. However, because this is not specifically stated in the text, I do not wish to color the narrative with possible interreligious complexities. Note 10. Struck from beyond might have been a lightning bolt. In some Latinate translations, it is a bolt from beyond. Note 11. Father, again, is probably Adam in this case. Uh, Note 12. uh, Whereas here, blood is written in meaning the cognate to vitae, uh, more than just blood itself. Uh, Addendum 13. This stanza has confused many scholars, including myself. I have chosen to represent it as my particular translation, which is that Adam, who is the father in this stanza, and it is Adam who cast Cain out. The reasoning behind this is that the one above never speaks directly to Cain. It is only through a medium that the one communicates its will to Cain, as we will see. Furthermore, the word father in the previous stanzas has always meant Adam. This contrasts heavily with the Genesis story, but it is internally consistent, and since Cain himself is said to have originated this particular narrative, we can take it on better authority, perhaps better than Noah, who penned Genesis. There are other interpretations, of course. In New York, Beckett once met a member of the Zabat, who claimed this section referred to our true father, Satan. He watched my child closely when he said this, and then something which Beckett can only describe as an imp appeared on his shoulder. We have gone to great pains to not deal with this vampire again. Addendum 14. Here now we get the basic idea behind the land of Nod. No longer is it simply not Eden, but it is now to be considered the exiled lands. Nod in the Hebraic translation of the text is basically the watering, wandering lands. This is perhaps because Adam has established himself outside of paradise and has created a territorial boundary between himself and the rest of the world. Thus, Nod is the same wilderness he was banished to, but now it is Cain who is leaving. 
One would think perhaps that Adam would have been a little bit more sympathetic to this, his last remaining son. However, it is possible that Adam's words in this were divinely inspired, or perhaps inspired out of rage. Thus, we see the traditional tragic, tumultuous lives of all vampires as being indicative of their origins. Beckett says this parallels the relationship all vampires have with their sires, but I like to think our own continued alliance proves this hypothesis incorrect. And lastly, note 15. The stanza is quite important to the dying god myth perspective of Cain. Cain is destined for darkness, a darkness, a dark land where he will learn much wisdom. This may refer to our own journey into death, from which our sires tear us when they feed us their own rich vite. Following the first times is the coming of Lilith. I was alone in the darkness, and I grew hungry. I was alone in the darkness, and I grew cold. I was alone in the darkness, and I cried. Then there came to me a sweet voice, a honey voice, words of succor, words of surcease. A woman, dark and lovely, with eyes that pierced the darkness, came to me. I know your story, Cain of Nod, she said, smiling. You are hungry. Come, I have food. You are cold. Come, I have clothes. You are sad. Come, I have comfort. Who would comfort one so cursed as I? Who would clothe me? Who would feed me? I am your father's first wife, who disagreed with the one above and gained freedom in the darkness. I am Lilith. Once I was cold and there was no warmth for me. Once I was hungry, and there was no food for me. Once I was sad, and there was no comfort for me. She took me in. She fed me. She clothed me. In her arms, I found comfort. I cried until blood trickled from my eyes, and she kissed them away. This text serves to depict the initial meeting between the figures of Cain and Lilith, particularly the state upon which Cain was in and the matronly aspect that Lilith takes up in their interaction. Cain, while not physically, is a battered child, whereas Lilith, having walked the same path, opens her arms to what is in a sense his other mother, or new mother. I say this not that it's imperative to mythological terminology, but because it provides a context for the modern audience as to the initial relationship the two held. De Laurent and Beckett notate as such. Note 16. These three things, hunger, cold, and fear, or sadness, still obviously attribute Cain with human feelings and failings. Cain is not yet a vampire in the traditional sense. He is, however, clearly cursed. 17. It was hard not to use Ishtar for this particular translation, for this stanza seems to speak of Ishtar. Certainly her honey voice and words of surcease are Ishtar's. Lilith would have to do, however, as many of the original works agree that it was Lilith in this narrative. Note 18. This stanza, and the others that follow here, I have seen in another form. This is the highly sought-after cycle of Lilith, which appears in many different forms. In looking for the original text for these stanzas, I was forced to go into the labyrinthine and saturnine depths of the world of the Diabolists. I started in Venice, where I met with some of the Order of the Black Rose, dark monks, some of whom had to communicate with sign language because their tongues had been severed and then mummified as magical talismans. I soon found that they hungered for kindred blood, and I was able to parlay some of my own vitae for information that led me to Boston, Massachusetts, in America. There, I met with a woman by the name of Selina, who at first refused to speak to me about the diabolic cycle of Lilith, but then allowed me to continue for some bizarre mystical purpose. She said that the Dark One herself asked to let me pass with the knowledge. I was followed through the streets of Boston by the Dark Clan themselves, the Nosferatu, until I got to a special bookstore. It is this book it is this bookstore that had in their back shelves a few fragments of the cycle of Lilith behind glass. I was allowed to view it for a few moments before the shop owner returned. The older man cursed loudly when he saw me and showed me the door quite firmly. I stood outside the door and heard the man berate his employee in some detail. They believed to be speaking confidently because they were speaking in a dialect of Italian native to Venice, but I had learned that dialect quite fluently and was able to listen for quite some time. I discovered that they were part of a dark circle of devil worshippers and followed the older man later that evening back to the cemetery where they held their rites. Although I was not able to find the devil worshippers in the cemetery, I did have a very strange encounter in the graveyard nonetheless. A woman appeared from the fog, as if by magic. By her aura, I knew her to be kindred, but could not guess how old or of what clan she was. 
she came to me and showed me a book bound in silver, holding a complete translation of the cycle of Lilith. She, she silenced me immediately, commanding me not to ask anything as long as she stood there. I had to obey. I was able to look at the tome and read it while she smiled at me in the light of a candle. Then she took the book, kissed me once on the forehead, and was gone into the night before I could ask her another question. I can't imagine who this mysterious woman was, but I do think that she is in some way connected with the spirit form of Lilith, for her powers of command were great, and she has a presence about her that was ancient. I can only thank her for the opportunity to glance at that fabled volume, and I think that this translation benefits singularly from her intervention. Note 19. It might be noted that Genesis speaks not at all of Lilith, the first wife of Adam. She is a creature of the Midrashim, the Hebrew parables. She is depicted as a demoness, cursed by God himself, because she would not be subservient to Adam. Lilith had apparently, at least in this narrative, spent some time in the land of Nod, and has built up her own power in this place. She apparently has comfort where no one else could take it. This, does not, this doesn't speak well for her being a demoness, and thus confined to hell, but then again hell wasn't a very popular place around this time in history. Note 20. Here's a major inconsistency in the narrative, and I have fought for many years to retain it, for I feel that it points to the fundamental flaw of the Book of Nod translations to date. Where did the blood tears of Cain come from, if not from the original curse? Was he then a vampire at that point? When did he exactly begin crying blood? When did he become a vampire? This is a nebulous point still, but I leave the inconsistency because I do not want this point to remain glossed over into history. My child Beckett uses this point to bol bolster his allegorical fancies. Even now, he travels to Harvard College there to study some ancient texts discovered in a well in the Sudan. He keeps going to discover some more of what he calls antediluvian mural works. The poor boy. After meeting Lilith and the coming of Lilith follows the scripture known as Lilith's Magic. And I dwelt for a time in the house of Lilith, and asked her, Out of darkness, how did you build this place? How did you make clothes? How did you grow food? And Lilith smiled and said, Unlike you, I am awake. I see the threads that spin all around you. I make that which I need out of power. Awaken me then, Lilith, I said. I have need for this power. And then I can make my own clothes, make my own food, make my own house. Worry creased Lilith's brow. I do not know what the awakening will do for you, for you are truly cursed by your father. You could die. You could be forever changed. Cain said, even so, a life without power will not be worth living. I would die without your gifts. I will not live as your thrall. Lilith loved me, and I knew this. Lilith would do what I had asked, though she did not wish it. And so, Lilith, bright-eyed Lilith, awakened me. She cut herself with a knife, bled for me into a bowl, and I drank deep. It was sweet. And then I fell into the abyss. I fell forever, falling into the deepest darkness. This text openly depicts Cain's need for power and how he practically begs Lilith to share how to use this power with him. In some scholarly opinions, Lilith is held as being the first mage, i.e. the first awakened, but like many topics, it is for another time, though it should not be forgotten in this context. In Awakening Cain, it seems as though more than just his abilities were awakened, so too was his beast, an idea that you will find hotly debated among kindred in whether it was Cain or it was Lilith who was the first vampire. Cain was the first murderer, and cursed by the father, however. Lilith too had been exiled into darkness, though without the same shackles of divine curse. Again, it simply serves as allegorical history, so I do implore you not to start a war over differing ideas on the matter. De Laurent's and Beckett's notations are as follows. 21. There has been argument on both sides of the following issue. Was Cain imprisoned in Lilith's house under her control, or did Cain stay there as an honored guest? This question is never fully answered, but might lend an interesting perspective if it could be proved one way or the other. Perhaps as some had suggested, the situation involved a little of both. Note 22. I have translated these words specifically in this fashion out of the advice of one Hephaestus, a friend of mine who was once a part of the mystical tradition known as the Order of Hermes. He maintains that Lilith was no woman, no demoness, but rather an original mage, and that she used her own particular magical qualities to awaken Cain's magical potential as well. 
This is the story of that awakening. I believe that what he says has merit, and it certainly fits in the translation of the story. If it is true that Cain was a wizard as well as Lilith, then the Tremere may indeed be clo closest to Cain, a theory to which Beckett violently objects. 23. Hephaestus indicates that this stanza may point to Lilith being perhaps the founder or one of the first supplicants in the magic tradition known as Verbena, which uses blood in its rituals. And note 24. This is often translated as, and then I fell into hell. I did not feel that the original text was attempting to say this, and I felt that the abyss seemed to indicate a less Judeo-Christian sort of place of torture. The next scripture, within the Chronicle of Cain, is one of the two lengthier scriptures within the Testament, this one being titled, The Temptation of Cain. And from the darkness came a bright shining light, fire in the night, and the archangel Michael revealed himself to me. I was unafraid, and I asked his business. Michael, general of heaven, wielder of the holy flame, said unto me, son of Adam, son of Eve, Thy crime is great, and yet the mercy of my father is also great. Will you not repent the evil that you have done, and let his mercy wash you clean? And I said to Michael, Not by the one above's grace, but my own will I live in pride. Michael cursed me, saying, Then for as long as you walk this earth, you and your child will fear my living flame, and it will bite deep and savor your flesh. And on the morning, Raphael came, Lambeth wings, light over the horizon, and driver of the sun, ward of the east. Raphael spoke, saying, Cain, son of Adam, son of Eve, your brother Abel forgives your sin. Will you not repent and accept the mercy of the Almighty? And I said to Raphael, Not by Abel's forgiveness, but my own will I be forgiven. Raphael cursed me, saying, Then for as long as you walk this earth, you and your children will fear the dawn, and the sun's rays will seek to burn you like fire wherever you hide always. Hide now, for the sun rises to take its wrath on you. But I found a secret place in the earth, and hid from the burning light of the sun. Deep in the earth, I slept until the light of the world was hidden behind the mountain of night. When I awoke from my day of sleep, I heard the sound of gentle rushing wings, and I saw the black wings of Uriel draped around me. Uriel, Reaper, Angel of Death, Dark Uriel, who dwells in darkness. Uriel spoke to me, quietly, saying, Son of Adam, Son of Eve, God Almighty has forgiven you your sin. Will you accept his mercy, and let me take you to your reward, no longer cursed? And I said to Darkwing Uriel, Not by God's mercy, but my own will I live. I am what I am, and I did what I did, and that will never change. And then, through dread Uriel, God Almighty cursed me, saying, And for as long as you walk this earth, you and your children will cling to darkness. You will only drink blood, you will eat only ashes, you will be always as you were at death, never dying, living on. You will walk forever in darkness, all you touch will crumble into nothing until the last days. I gave a cry of anguish at this terrible curse, and tore at my flesh. I wept blood, I caught the tears in a cup, and drank them. When I looked up from my drink of sorrow, the archangel Gabriel, gentle Gabriel, Gabriel, Lord of mercy, appeared to me. The archangel Gabriel said unto me, Son of Adam, son of Eve, behold the mercy of the Father is greater than you can ever know, for even now there is a path, opened a road of mercy, and you shall call this road Golconda and tell your children of it, for by that road may they come once again to dwell in the light. And with that, the darkness was lifted like a veil, and the only light was Lilith's bright eyes. Looking around me, I knew that I had awakened. When my energies first surged through me, I discovered how to move like lightning, celerity, how to burrow the strength of the earth, potence, how to be a stone, fortitude. These were like breathing once was to me. Lilith then showed me how she hides herself from hunters, obfuscate, how she commands obedience, dominate, and how she demands respect, presence. Then, awakening myself further, I found the ways to alter forms, protean, the way to have dominion over animals, animalism, the way to make eyes see sight, aspects. Then, Lilith commanded that I stop, saying that I had overreached my bounds, 
that I had gone too far, that I threatened my very essence. She used her powers and commanded me to stop. Because of her power, I heeded her. But deep within me, a seed was planted, a seed of rebellion. And when she turned her face from me, I opened myself up once more to the night and saw the infinite possibilities in the stars and knew that a path of power, a path of blood, was mine for the taking. And so I awakened in me this final path from which all other paths would grow. With this newest power, I broke the bonds that the Lady of Night put on me. I left the damned queen that evening, cloaking myself in shadows. I fled the lands of Nod and came at last to a place where not even her demons could find me. The temptation of Cain serves to facilitate a number of actions that took place. Firstly, that after Cain was awakened by Lilith, it had also awakened like a surge his curse, and God, as written, sent his current most honored four angels, Michael, Raphael, Uriel, and Gabriel, to offer Cain redemption, but Cain refused. With each redemption, his curse was expanded and worsened. These curses served to depict the vampiric condition as well as the rumored path of Golconda, a seemingly last bastion of divine hope for kindred. After the divine messengers were finished offering Cain redemption, Cain learned to wield his abilities under the guide of Lilith, but as Cain, as Cain grew stronger, Lilith grew more worried. It's very important to note that these are the Cain-derived forms of disciplines that we still see ex exuded to this day. She commanded Cain to stop progressing on with his understanding of vampiric powers, and as she did this, Cain in his power grew arrogant and loathed someone wielding their power over him. But he obeyed, but once he was given a moment's chance, he fled from Lilith to find a new home. And while it's vague as to how, it alludes to the fact that he went somewhere where Lilith was not going to follow, but it does not clarify whether she would or could not follow. De Laurent and Beckett needlessly have much to say on the text. 25. Once again, not to cross mythologize too much, but I could do nothing else but translate the angels into angels and Michael into Michael, even though the shining ones mentioned in the original text do not specifically seem to be angels. I was unable to come up with a cognate that would fit. Still, I feel that they do not hamper the overall feel of the narrative, and so they remain. Their traditional Kabbalistic correspondences also remain as they were originally written. 26. This is perhaps a strong rebuff of the one above. Cain seems to still be angry about his exile. 27. This is the legendary curse of fire. It is perhaps among the strongest curses of the day. It is set, it set up an eternal enmity between the kindred and the singular source of life in the world, the fire. Fire was the mortal's way of keeping out the darkness, the wolves. It provided a center of community and allowed them to create new technologies. This put us out of that light forever, and was designed to make us outcast forever. It is perhaps this particular curse with also made hospitality to so important among the kindred. 28. Raphael being the Archangel of the Dawn. 29. An early survival instinct, obviously. Cain instinctively seeks the earth. 30. Uriel's role as the angel of death would place him in the ultimate position to be the vessel of God's judgment on Cain. Only through Uriel could God himself choose to punish our father. 31. Note here that Uriel is offering not to preserve Cain, but rather to take him to his reward, i.e. death. 32. Is this a mockery of the more traditional I am that I am phrase of the Bible? 33. The first use of the freely translated words, God Almighty. 34. Eating ashes is thought to be a metaphor for the tragic vampire existence. I can find no other reference to eating ashes and can only assume it is an idiom which cannot be translated. Other versions of the Book of Nod have translated each eating ashes into knowing only sadness. 35. This is perhaps a poetic statement. It certainly emphasizes that Cain is consuming his own sadness. 36. The fact that there is an important diamond city in India, also called Golconda, may or may not have bearing to this particular stanza. I am beginning to think that the term was originally coined by Saula, who was known to travel to the far and Middle East on quests of enlightenment. And 37. I have heard of additional sections here describing more of the powers of Cain developed. 
According to my old friend Malk Content, the original version of this went on for 1001 stanzas. Malk also claims his left pinky is made out of chocolate mousse in answers to the name Harold, so I will stand by the version I have here. After the temptation of Cain, the scripture seemingly takes a detour. However, the next two pieces of text are relevant in building the backbone of mythos that contributes to every Cain-derived kindred. The first of these two scriptures is titled Zilla's Tale. Let me tell the tale of Zilla, first loved of Cain, first wife of Cain, the sweetest blood, the softest skin, and the clearest eyes. Alone of Cain's newest childer, did Cain desire her, and she was not mindful of his desire, turning away from him. Not gifts, not sacrifices, not perfumes, not doves, not beautiful dancers, not singers, not oxen, not sculpture, not beautiful clothes, nothing would turn Zilla's heart from stone to sweet fruit. So Cain pulled at his beard, and tore at his hair, and took to roaming the wilderness at night, thinking of her, burning for her, and one night, Cain came upon an old crone, singing to the moon. Cain said to the crone, Why do you sing so? And the crone replied, Because I yearn for what I cannot have. Cain said to the crone, I yearn also. What can one do? The crone smiled and said, Drink of my blood this night, Cain, father of kindred, and return tomorrow night. Then will I tell you the wisdom of the moon. Cain drank at the crone's bare neck and departed. The next night, Cain found the crone sleeping on a rock. Wake up, crone, Cain said. I have returned. The crone opened one eye and said, I dream of the solution for you this night. Drink once more of me, and then return tomorrow night. Bring a bowl of clay, bring a sharp knife, and I will have your answer then. Once again, Cain took blood from the crone, who immediately fell back into a deep slumber. When Cain returned the next night, the crone looked up at him and smiled. Greetings, Lord of the Beast, the crone said. I have the wisdom you seek. Take some of my blood into the bowl that you have, and mix in these berries and these herbs, and drink deep of the elixir. You will be irresistible. You will be potent. You will be masterful. You will be ardent. You will be glowing. The heart of Zilla will melt like the snows in spring. And so, Cain drank from the crone's elixir, because he was so in love with Zilla and he so desired her love in return. And the crone laughed. The crone laughed aloud. She had tricked him. She had trapped him. And Cain was angry beyond compare. Cain reached out with his powers to rend this crone apart with his strength. The crone cackled and said, do not. And Cain could do nothing against her. The crone chuckled and said, love me. And Cain could do nothing stare into her ancient eyes and desire her leathery skin. The crone laughed and said, make me immortal. And Cain embraced her. She cackled again, laughed with the pure ecstasy of the embrace, for it did not pain her. I have made you powerful, Cain of Enoch, Cain of Nod, but you will forever be bound to me. I have made you master of all, but you will never forget. Your blood, potent as it is now, will bond to those who drink it, as you did, once a night, for three nights. You will be the master. They will be your thrall, as you are mine. For though Zillow will love you as you wanted, you will love me forever. Go now, and claim your lovely bride. I will wait for you in the darkest places, while I brew more potions for your health. And so, heavy-hearted, Cain returned to Enoch, and each night, for three nights, Zilla drank from her sire, though she did not know it. And on the third night, Cain announced he would marry Zilla, his sweetest child, and she agreed. The tale of Zilla is an enticing one alone, however there is much to gleam here. The blood bond so prevalently utilized within kindred society is not entirely native to the vampiric experience, nor is it necessarily a necessity if one were to look into things further. For example, the crone in the story is hotly believed to be a mage of even more debated origin. What matters is, yes, she enhanced Cain's ability through the giving through the giving of his blood and enticing bond. It's noted that it was not taught to him. It was a blood ceremony of sorts, meaning in a theoretical manner, it's a spell which can be broken. 
Though this idea is challenged by De Laurent and Beckett further in, Clan Tremere has much more knowledge on the subject and we can extrapolate on such ideas further at a later date. What's more interesting, in a parable manner of speaking, is that Cain was so heartstruck that he essentially, once given the ability to do so, forced Zilla, his unrequited love, to love him and marry him in return. While, I'm, while I am a well aware of the hell-wrought things us kindred are capable, even this act, such an act of dominance, is blood curdling. De La Rat and Beckett have enough worth mentioning on the matter. 38. Zilla sometimes translated as Sila. This tale is translated from a much more folklore-influenced original text. A version of this tale is told by some of the oldest Russian kindred, and I have reason to believe it has roots in Russian folk tales. Remember that among kindred there is no incest taboo and in lusting after the blood of your child. Indeed, this is perhaps indicative of the Methuselah's attitudes they often create a child or to feed upon. 40. A flagrant transliterative a flagrant transliterative idiom, but once that I had felt literary importance. Imagine Cain with a full long beard tugging on it. This is perhaps the only descriptive feature of Cain that we have on record, and its provenance is impure. 41. This crone remains a mystery to archaeologists trying to locate the source of this story. I believe that the crone is a shaman, or witch, or priestess who perhaps knew a bit about Cain from relations with a demon, or some kind of familiar spirit. In sticking with his allegorical paradigm, Beckett suggests that she may be a metaphor for the lust we have for blood and the control it has over us. 42. Another clue. She is affiliated with the moon. I originally believe this pointed to her origins as a to her origins as a lupine shaman, but I learned from my gangrel friends that they do not twist their spells in such fashion. 43. Others have translated Cain's title as Master of the Blood Fury in this instance. And 44. In Enoch, marriage between kindred was common. I have read fragments of the Love Hymn to Zilla, which has led me to believe that it carried with it specific ownership of all house slaves and property, as well as special privileges such as the ability to temporarily invoke one's spouse's power. The second piece in this relative detour following Zilla's tale is titled aptly The Tale of the Crone. For a year and a day, Cain labored in service to a crone, who with blood wisdom bound him as surely as any prisoner. She would visit him at night, force him to give up his blood for her secret elixirs and potent formulas. She would take his childer's childer, and they would never be heard from again. But Cain was wise. He did not drink from her ever again, and she did not ask him to, thinking that he was ever in her thrall. One night, Cain went to the crone in the forest, and told her of terrible dreams that he had during his torpor. I fear for my life, crone. I fear the prophecy of Oriel, and my children's lust for my blood. Tell me secret knowledge that I might be powerful against my own. And the crone went to a tree made of gopher wood, and broke off a limb. She took a sharp knife and sharpened the limb. Take this piece of living wood, sharp, strong, pierce the heart of your wayward child. It will render him still and yours to command. Instead of feasting on your heart's blood, he will feel the weight of your justice. Cain said, Thank you, mother. And with that, moving in quick movements, Cain took the stake of gopher wood, seized it, and drove it deep within the crown's heart. Because Cain, wise Cain, had fed not upon her for a year and a day, and because he forced his will through his hands, he broke the bond she held on him and turned his fortune. She laughed again as blood welled up and poured out of her mouth. Her eyes poured out hate. Cain kissed her once, kissed her cold, withered lips, and left her there to Raphael's gentle smile, the sun that rises. This text is short and simple, but revealing all at once. It reminds us of the expiration date for an unattended blood bond that Cain again wished cunning, but also of how to rend a kindred still and inert, again physically dead until otherwise removed, but not mentally or spiritually. Even here it's shown how Cain himself has broken this magic, but could he have gone further with breaking the spell? It's possible, but unlikely given the apparent lust for power we've seen Cain undergo so far. I find Gopherwood to be an interesting topic as well, but we'll speak of such things later. It also reminds us eloquently of our demise in the sunlight. Per usual, De Laurent and Beckett have only a few words on the subject of the tale. 
Note 45, the traditional lunar year, it is such a mythological cliché, especially among the wise woman traditions of the pagan folk, that I must count it as a purely symbolic period of time. And note 46, a traditional material, strong and sturdy, the Ark of Noah was built of it. The last, lengthiest, and vastly important scripture within the Chronicle of Cain is titled The Tale of the First City, and it goes as follows. In the beginning, there was only Cain. Cain who sacrificed his brother out of love. Cain who was cast out. Cain who was cursed forever with immortality. Cain who was cursed with the lust for blood. It is Cain from whom we all come. Our sire's sire. For the passing of an age, he lived in the land of Nod, in loneliness and suffering. For an eon, he remained alone. But the passing of memory drowned his sorrow. And so, he returned to the world of mortals. To the world his brother, Seth, the thirdborn of Eve, and Seth's children, had created. He returned, and was made welcome, for none would turn against him due to the mark that was laid upon him. The people saw his power, and worshipped him. He grew powerful, and his power was strong. His ways of awe and command were great, and the children of Seth made him king of their great city, the first city. But Cain grew lonely in his power. Deep within him, the seed of loneliness blossomed and grew a dark flower. He saw within his blood the potence of fertility. By calling up demons and listening to whispered wisdom, he learned the way to make a child for his own. He came to know its power, and doing so, decided to embrace one of those near him. And lo, Uriel, dread Uriel, revealed himself to Cain that very night and said to him, Cain, Though powerful you are, and marked of God, know you this, that any child you make will bear your curse, that any of your progeny will forever walk in the land of Nod, and fear flame and sun, drinking blood only, and eating ashes only. And since they will carry their father's jealous seed, they will forever plot and fight amongst themselves. Doom not those of Adam's grandchildren who seek to walk in righteousness, Cain. Stay your dread embrace. Still. Cain knew what he must do, and a young man named Enoch, who was the most beloved of Seth's kin, began to make, be begged to be made son to the Dark Father. And Cain, mindful though he was of Uriel's words, seized Enoch, and wrapped him in the dark embrace. And so it came to pass that the Cain beget Enoch, and so, doing so, named the first city Enoch. And so doing did Enoch beg for a brother, a sister, and Cain, Indulgent father gave these to him, and their names were Zillah, whose blood was the most favored of Cain, and Erad, whose strength served Cain's arm. And these kindred of Cain's learned the ways of making progeny of their own, and they embraced more of Seth's kin, unthinking. And then, wise Cain said, an end to this crime, there shall be no more. And as Cain's word was the law, his brood obeyed him. The city stood for many ages and became the center of a mighty empire. Cain grew close to those not like him. The children of Seth knew him, and he, to turn, knew them. But the world grew dark with sin. Cain's children wandered here and there, indulging their dark ways. Cain felt anger when his children fought. He discovered deceit when he saw them make word war. He knew sadness when he saw them abuse the children of Seth. Cain read the signs, and in the darkening sky, said nothing. Then came the great deluge a great flood that washed over the world. The city was destroyed, the children of Seth with it. Again, Cain fell into great sorrow and went into solitude, and he left us, his progeny, to our own ends. We found him, after much searching, deep in the earth, and he bade us go, saying that the flood was a punishment for his having returned to the world of life and subverting the true law. He asked us to go so that he might sleep. So we returned alone to find the children of Noah and announced that we were the new rulers. Each created a brood in order to claim the glory of Cain, yet we did not have his wisdom or restraint. A great war was raged, the elders against their children, just as Uriel had said, and the children slew their parents. They rose up, used fire and wood, swords and claws, to destroy those who had created them. The rebels then built a new city out of the fallen empire, 
They collected the 13 clans that had been scattered by the Great War and brought them all together. They brought in the Kingship Clan, Ventru, the Clan of the Beast, Gangrel, the Moon Clan, Malkavian, the Clan of the Hidden, Nosferatu, the, Va the Wanderer Clan, Ravnos, the Clan of the Rose, Toreador, the Night Clan, Lysandra, the Clan of Shapers, Timitsis, the Snake Clan, Setites, the Clan of Death, Giovanni, the Healer's Clan, Salot, the Clan of the Hunt, Asimites, and the Learned Clan, Bruja. They made a city, a beautiful city, and the people worshipped them as gods. They created new progeny of their own, the fourth generation of Cainites. But they feared the Jihad, the prophecy of Uriel, and it was forbidden for those children to create others of their kind. This power their elders kept for themselves. When a child was created, it was hunted down and killed, and its sire with it. Although Cain was away from us, we did feel his careful eye watching us, and we knew that he marked our movements and our ways. He cursed Malkath when that one defamed his image and doomed him to insanity forever. When, Nosferam when Nosferatu was found indulging his tastes in foul ways with his own children, Cain laid his hand on Nosferatu and told him that he would forever wear his evil and twisted visage. And cursed us all for killing the first part of his children, the second generation. As we had hunted them down one by one, Zilla the Beautiful, Erad the Strong, and Enoch, the first ruler. And we mourned them all, as we were all of a kind, and all of the families of Cain's childer. Though this city was as great as Cain's, eventually it grew old, as do all living things. It slowly began to die. The gods at first did not see the truth, and when they at last looked about them, it was too late. For as Uriel had said, the seed of evil planted blossomed as a red as a blood-red rose. And Troy, child of his child's child, rose up and slew his father Bruja and ate of his flesh. Then war racked the city, and nothing could ever be as it was. The Thirteen saw their city destroyed and their power extinguished, and they were forced to flee, their progeny along with them. But many were killed in the fight, for they had grown weak. With their authority gone, all were free to create their own broods and soon there were many new kindred who ruled across the face of the earth, but this could not last. Over time, there came to be many of the kindred, and then there was war once again. The elders were already deep in hiding, for they had learned caution, but their children had found their own cities and broods, and, as it, and it is they who were killed in the great wave of war. There was war so total that there are none of that generation to speak of themselves any longer. Waves of mortal flesh were sent across continents in order to crush and burn the cities of the kindred. Mortals thought they were fighting their own wars, but it is for us that they spilt their blood. Once this war was over, all of the kindred hid from one another and from the humans that surrounded them. In hiding, we remain today, but the Jihad continues still, and none will say when Cain will rise again from his sleep in the earth and call for the city Gehenna, the last city, the city of judgment. The Jihad continues still. There's much to go over with this text, so I shan't dawdle. Much of this text is told almost as though Cain himself had written it, though further in it is subject to debate. It's it tells of how Cain actually cared for mortals, aka the children of Seth. Not to be confused with Seth, Seth is the third-born child of Adam and Eve. Cain grew arrogant with his progeny, allowing his childer to make a series of grandchilder that he seemed to rather disfavor particularly in their feuding and abuse of mortals. He wanted them to be proud nobles as gods, but instead they grew miraculously more arrogant and deluded than he had once been. He knew the signs and allowed the city to be destroyed. He fled, seemingly to a cave of sorts is my guess, to rest and I would imagine almost meditate on his actions, for his adoring grandchilder found him and more or less asked him, what do we do now? But according to the text, Cain acted as the archetypical grumpy grandfather and told him to leave, that the flood was a punishment for their and his actions, and that he just wanted to get some sleep. If any of this is true, and I have some of my own doubts, I would assume this to be one of Cain's most regrettable actions. In doing so, he ensured Oriel's prophecy of eternal war among kindred into fruition, not to mention he snowballed into motion the death of his own childer, the three whom he actually loved. For acting in such a way to his grandchilder, the 13 of them essentially killed their parents and started the ever so complex series of events that has led to the Jihad as we know and understand it today. 
And while I would like to give them props in attempting to create what we can call now the Second City, it was doomed to fail, given the selfish ways they held their godhood over mankind. Not to mention, when all was said and done, it grew nearly impossible to expect 13 siblings and their families to respect each other simply because they shared Cain's blood. While I find it interesting to note that I do not doubt that the majority of wars shared between Kine are kindred instigated, I still cannot disregard the fact that we see ourselves in Kine as much as they reflect themselves unto us. For we were all children of Seth at one time or another, aside from Cain himself. I would imagine De La and Beckett would have much to say on the topic of the scripture, however I only have a single notation from the beginning of the scripture, so whether it is a problem with my transcription or how the book was initially published, I doubt that this is all they had to say on the matter. Regardless, here is their one and only note. Ah, 47. This is perhaps the best known part of the Book of Nod because of the frequent copying by the Tremere and Venture clans of this fragment. There are many colloquial versions of it. My first task was to totally disregard these popular versions and go on to tackle the truth of the matter. Thus, you see my translations of the non-traditional verses in brackets. So, we can assume that the rest of the brackets then are non-traditional aspects of the scripture, though, again, I feel as though they would have much more to say on the matter. And with that being addressed, that is the Chronicle of Cain. I hope that this oration scholarly dissection has proven useful to you in your endeavors to interpret and understand the Book of Nod. I will be continuing the next video with the Chronicle of Shadows, where we will continue to break down the next testament of the Book of Nod. Also, if any terminology I use here seems foreign or confusing to you, be sure to check out my lexicon series that should be airing within the next month, if, it's not, if it is not already out by the time you're seeing this. As we continue the series, I hope that in your undeath you can find some sort of semblance of belonging or direction within kindred society, be it from the Book of Nod or some other form of information I am able to rely upon you. For now, may the shadows guide you, and I bid you adieu. Good night.